Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Anita, you you stay with us because I, I I'm going to hear from Simon and talk Ina, but I'd love you to speak together if that's all right with you, Simon, because you uh, you have you doubt about the racism in this country, and Anita's just said that no matter where she has worked all her life, it, she has experienced it. So Simon, tell me why you doubt it or why you doubt the the, the scale of it. Um, I doubt the scale of it because I think, well, like your last couple of callers have segregated themselves, in, I, I, I think, into like a, an individual box rather than an inclusive one uh, by using the word we or the African Caribbean society or um, things like that. Now, there is racism in this country, but there is a lot of um, groups out there which I think are racist, including one of your callers on earlier who was um, a member of the National Black Police Association. No, we called him, yeah. Yes, um... Why is that racist? That there's a, you, you, th well, you think the existence of a black police association is racist? Yes, it is, because they only include officers of African, African Caribbean and Asian origin. Um, so, in effect, that is leaving out white police officers. Now, if you were to put a national white police association out there, instantly everybody would be jumping on the bandwagon calling it racist. But do you understand um, why there wasn't a need for a white police Association. Why is that? But do you no? Well, let, but I, let, let me let me do this one question at a time. Do you understand why there wasn't a need for a white police association? Because you know what it was just called the police association. Yeah, but it's not anymore, is it? There's there are so many different police associations. <laughs> there's the Hindu one. There's the black. There's the women. There's the LGBT one. There is not a white one. But you know I'm what? Th they're in a workplace. They have the right to have their needs met in the workplace, don't they? They do, but but doesn't every single police officer? No yes, and they have the police association. Yes, and they have they they have representation if they want it. So why is there then a requirement to have separate splinter cells, if you like, or police associations? That splinter is cells is an unfortunate choice of language. They're not terrorist groups. Oh, right. They're they're trade. <laughs> They're like, like a kind of trade union. Representing. Um, there's other things as well. You know, like Leroy said that he said he couldn't get a loan because he was black. I'm sure the bank didn't even look into that when they do a credit check. I don't think they. Well, said, how are you oh, sure? Are you how are you sure? Why are you immediately well, disbelieving Leroy's lived experience? Is it? So it's not that he might not have the collateral to actually get a loan. I don't know the Could detail. That not be it? Well, there we, there we go. You no, know, no, there we go. No, 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 Simon, not there we go. I don't know his finances. You don't know his finances. He's made a statement. And, and you know, let's do him the courtesy of... He focused on of... one thing, didn't he? He focused on colour. And the media are really good at it. Look at it when, even in the British... Well, I invited him on to talk about race and English, you know, and, and yeah, Windrush, and so... But that's fair enough, yeah, isn't it? That's what we're discussing. Look at the media and the way they're reporting. Can I? Uh, all right. Simon, let me bring Anita in here because I'm sure she'll yeah. do a better job than me. Go on, Anita. Simon just made a statement um, about um, a black person going for a bank loan and didn't get it. This, these are the sort of racist attitude people like Simon that really get up my nose. It has been happening for so long in this country when a black person goes for a loan and cannot get it and yet you're in a job you're earning some of them earning very good salary but they don't get the loan therefore they cannot set up a business it's everything seems to be against the person of color once you're black <clears throat> it goes against the grain and this is what simon don't seem to get in his head simon how it goes against the I grain think... of a person trying to better themselves but because of your person of color you don't get the same chance as everybody else Right. Well, you, you do get the same chance as everybody. The in this country against colour will never be sorted out until people of Britain sit down and really search their heart and own up to the fact that this racism is so deep-seated against people of African skin that it, it, it's unbelievable how awful it is. But do you not think that perhaps that's just a feeling you have in your head? Um, I, I'll give no. you a, quick, a very quick example. I went on ho a holiday to Northern Ireland. I went to Gary slash London Gary, whichever one you want to call it. And in my head, I felt nervous being what I would call a British person in London Gary slash Gary. 
um, only because of the trouble that went on there. And that was all in my head. Everything was perfectly fine. Everyone was really nice to me. So do you not think perhaps some of this is going to be in your head? Not every single person in the UK is going to be racist. There is a few... No. Anita's not saying that. Yeah. Anita's yeah. not saying everybody in the UK is racist. No, 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 but yeah. it's widespread. It's widespread. Many, so widespread can I just say, there's many decent European in this country, and I've met many of them, or very, very decent European. And I take people with, I treat people with respect. If they show me respect, I return the respect. If they do not show me the respect, I just ignore them, yeah? But it is not something that's in your head when you know you've gone to school in this country, you've worked all your life in this country, and you're trying to set up a business. But because of the color of your skin, you do not get anywhere. And it's not that you may try it once, you try it over and over and over again. And the grain is always against you because of your color of your skin. Anita, thank you very much for your call. I'm going to leave it there if I may. And Simon, thank you for yours and thanks for conversing with Anita as well. Uh, Seamus is in Wallington. Seamus, what would you like to say? Uh, hello, Ian. Um, I'm very, very disappointed by what the House of Lords have decided to do. I'm not surprised, but what I feel is going on here is a deliberate action from a combination of... I, I will be strong and call them... I believe they're traitors. They're anti-democratic who are acting against the best interests of this country, combined with big business, to do everything they but, can... To, to but to play me. devil's advocate, Shane, I mean, that's a very strong word to use um, in, in this context. They, they would no doubt say to you, Shane, that they think they're doing the best thing for their country and they're doing the patriotic thing. Now, you may disagree with them, but that's no reason to call them traitors. They are acting in the interests of big business... Um, we voted to retain control of our laws, rules and regulations and to achieve full independence. They want us to stay part of uh, an unelected, in a large part, an unelected um, oligarchy. Um, and they are doing everything they can to circumvent it. And, uh, and they're pushing uh, as far as they can to see how the British public are reacting. Now, I am praying that there are sensible people in the Conservative Party that will draw a red line on this and say to Theresa May, no, this is not going to be watered down. This is a resignable issue and we will force a general election because the, the Tory party needs to cleanse itself of the likes of Anna Soubry. We don't want her or anything like her anywhere near our party. They are not acting in the best interest well, of the Well, your country. problem there, Seamus, is that if you are a Conservative supporter and that is your view, what, you're, what you want the Conservative Party to be is a bit of a sect, whereas, as I said um, on Question Time, all successful political parties are big tents that they can incorporate uh, John Redwood and Anna Subri in the same party, just as the Labour Party can incorporate John McDonnell and Chuka Amuna. If you become a narrow sect like the Republican Party has become, um, I think there is a very difficult time ahead for your party. OK, that's a challenge. Uh, I, I accept that. But I, I have to say, I feel passionate about this because this is the most dangerous time in our history, I believe. I think this is a massive threat to, to, to people and their democracy. People are being ignored on this vote and we're being told we're stupid and we're thick. And that is incensing well, people. I yeah, and, and I, I, look, I don't wholly disagree with some of what you've said there because if they go back on the customs union, if they went back on the commitment to come out of the single market, to my mind, you might as well have stayed in. Uh, and, and if that happens, I mean, I don't have any active involvement in politics now, but um, I, I can assure you that I would, I, would be attempt, I would be tempted never to bother voting again because if you vote, for, vote in a referendum and then the government of the day completely ignores the result of that referendum... Um, I mean, what does that say about our attitudes to democratic votes? Seamus, thank you very much. Let's ask Glenn in Milton Keynes what he thinks. Good evening, Glenn. Oh, nice, how are you doing, mate? All right. I'm doing all right, and you? Listen, I'm in the building trade, and uh, yep. what I've got, you know, every year I put the flag up, and last, I couldn't believe it, last year, on St. George's Day, yep. there were tens of dozens of flags and, you know, and vans and cars and all that. Today I was working in Kensington and Chelsea. Apart from my van, there was two flags on the cars. And when I asked a few people going down, I said, half of them didn't even know it was St George's Day. And I asked the other half, you know, I said, you know, it's St George's Day. Half said, I don't really care. And I thought, hold up, you know, can't you proud of your country? But what really annoyed me this morning, you, 
I put the telly on. Yeah. All the station, BBC, ITV, nothing was said about St George's Day. Well, you know, this is six in the morning. But it was St Patrick's Day. First thing they said on the morning... Was oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, Glenn, could it be there were fewer St George's flags where you were because you were in one of the wealthiest parts of the United Kingdom? Well, no, because last year I, was, I worked around that way. Yeah. And there was lots of vans and people who had flags and all that. And even driving through on the motorway and all that, because I got down the M1. Yep. You know, there was flags and all that. Nothing. Right, so, thought, so, know, so today was pretty poor, Glenn, was it? I think so. And I said to people, you know, and they said, oh, someone said, oh, it's a racist thing. I said, you realise... Did they really? Yeah, I said, yeah, I said do you realise St George was a Turk? And he didn't even know that. <laughs> you know, and I said, you know, I said, you've got to be proud of your country. But I said, I can't believe it. This morning, I put on a, you know, uh, Pierce Morgan. I thought he will come out saying nothing. Well, I was uh, well, I was on with Piers Morgan. I was on at eight I ten. Must, I must be working hard when you were. When but you then, were on but there, by right? ten past eight, Glenn, you're hard at it, aren't you? That's Toiling right. in the vineyard. Oh, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> well, I Glenn, I, I Glenn, I, you know, your general point that a lot of people wouldn't have even known it was St George's Day and that the media do not make as much of a fuss of it as they do the, the other national holidays is absolutely justified. So what should we do, Glenn? Should we have a national holiday? Oh, without a doubt. You know, I remember, I mean, I'm 61 now, but I remember as a kid going to school and every, the flags were flying and all that, you know? But in everything now, you're, so, you're walking on eggshells now. Yeah, well, let's, let's, uh, let's on, uh, not we worry about the eggshells. Let's the, we'll worry about the eggshells. Uh, let's get on. Glenn, I promise you, I'll be out there next year flying the flag. In fact, I'll tell you what, I'm going to come out in sympathy with you right now by flying one here in the studio. All right, Glenn, I'm displaying the Cross of St George right now in sympathy with you and to say to people, it's St George's Day. Listen, listen to Glenn. Be proud of the flag and let's celebrate the day. What on earth's wrong with that? Glenn, thank you very much indeed for the call. Poor old Glenn there, feeling lonely with his flag. I thought I'd help him out a little bit there. Tom is a first-time caller from Twickenham. Good evening, Tom. Hi. So, they say that it's right-wing and xenophobic to celebrate St George's Day and to fly this flag. That can't be right, can it? Uh, well, I, I just think it's a, um, a symptom of being English... Yeah. But um, it's, we think it's sort of undignified to express pride in our nationality. Yes, yes, I know. We're almost ashamed of it, aren't we? Yeah. And yet the Scots aren't, the Irish aren't, the Welsh aren't. So what's wrong with yeah. us, Tom? Because uh, England is, is so much um, bigger than, than the other um, home, home nations. Well, that is true, and we are, by population, we are 86% of the United Kingdom, a figure that's quite staggering. Yeah, so I think... Uh, it seems arrogant. It seems um, it seems embarrassing to ex express pride in being English uh, because we have such a dominant position in the UK. I think there's something in what you say, um, but isn't there also, Tom, amongst some on the intellectual left, a certain sense of self-loathing about being English? Uh, yes, yes, there is. I definitely get that. Did you did you hear my comment, my quote earlier from George Orwell? Uh, yes, I did, yeah. You know, I just want to repeat the bit that really matters. You know, it is unquestionably true that almost any English intellectual would feel more ashamed of standing to attention during God Save the Qu King than stealing from the poor box. I mean, this was written over 70 years ago. And that attitude has persisted, hasn't it? Yeah, and I, I think it's, it's partly because there's so much to be proud of. To, to, England has, has done so much, you know, yep. the, the um, Industrial Revolution, we've, you know, the, the British Empire is the biggest empire in history. I think there's so much to be proud of that it's actually embarrassing and we have to sort of, like, keep it under control because... Yeah, you know, well, that, that slight sort of English yeah. understatedness not being too boastful. No, I do understand yeah. that. I do understand that. And, Tom, you make a very valid point. Maybe the size of England in relation to the rest of the UK has made us a little bit less celebratory about St George's Day, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't still do it. Thank you. We do live in a country where, fortunately, we are allowed to protest. We have the right to protest. But where does one individual's right to protest actually intimidate or harass another person seeking to attend that clinic? Christian Hacking is a spokesman with Abort 67. Perhaps, Mr Hacking, you could start by explaining what the organisation is about and how you came by its name. Good morning. Hello, good morning, Nick. Um, yeah, Abort 67 is a public educational organisation that uses 
images of um, uh, abortion victims, so pictures of aborted embryos, fetuses, etc., right. to help educate women um, on what abortion is. We operate outside of clinics, but also um, more broadly in the public square in Whitehall and oh, city see. centres across the country. And so you have mounted demonstrations, if that's the word that we use, outside clinics, have you, Mr Hacking? Yeah, demonstrations you could use. Um, we, public education displays, our opponents call us protesters. We don't really, we don't feel we protest um, abortion. We feel like we show the reality of abortion and abortion protests itself. And do you, how close do you seek to get to these abortion clinics? Well, we, so we have, we have to make sure we're um, uh, abiding the law. We don't break the law at any point. So, so we're not allowed to block public walkways. We're not allowed to block um, entrances to the clinics. We stand at a distance. We don't use megaphones. We don't shame women. We, we simply... Um, you subject them to pictures, though, I understand, pictures of fetuses, don't you? Yes, yeah, we show, so we show them the reality of what an abortion mm. does to a pre-born child so that they can make and, an And if a young decision. woman, or if, sorry, no, it doesn't have to be young, my apologies, if a woman is attending a clinic on what's probably a harrowing day for her anyway, how helpful is it for you and your colleagues to show her picture of, pictures of fetuses? Well, it all depends on um, who that woman is. Well, how do you know who she is? Well, you don't. So Precisely. We don't, we, don't, we don't assume. We don't assume to know who she is. Um, we do facilitate this by, um, as a courtesy, we don't need to do this by law, we, we put up warning signs um, outside of the clinics um, to, to warn people of a sensitive disposition or, or somebody who may not want to see the image. Um, and, and we respect women's right to look the other way. This, this idea... Oh, I'm so grateful you respect a woman's right to look the other way because the alternative would be what? You'd hold her head and force her to look at it? No, no, that's not. I wouldn't say that's the alternative well, at all. Right. I'm saying, I'm saying, I'm saying, in this debate, you have to watch out, Nick, because we, 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 we run the risk of infantilizing women quite significantly. We treat them like toddlers Can, who yeah. cannot um, engage in in scientific discussion about um, abortion and what it is and Can what I, it does to the pre-born child. I, I will come back to you in a moment. Just, just, just to read, and this is something that always interests my listeners. Are you opposed to abortion on any grounds? That is the oft-quoted case of, for instance, incest or rape. So, uh, so we're against the killing of innocent human beings. No, no, I, w I wonder if you could just answer. Don't, don't phrase it your way politely. If you could just answer, are you against abortion even in the cases of incest or rape? So, so nothing about the the complexity of a situation. That I I I shall I take that as a yes then? Because I haven't got all day. So I sense you are right. against abortion, even if the woman has been raped or is well, about. We're, we're simply, Nick. We're, we're raising the question as to whether it's a human being or not, and whether right. it's. So I'm going to take that as yes, and I'll come back to you in a moment. It would have been far easier to have said yes, by the way. Catherine O'Brien is head of media and policy at BPAS, the British Pregnancy Advisory Service. Um, do you support the idea of these buffer zones? Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Absolutely, we support uh, these buffer zones. You know, for years, our, our staff and the women they care for have been forced to, to, to tolerate and put up with harassment on a daily basis that we would but not accept what? outside any other healthcare facility. So why should a 100-metre buffer zone around one of your clinics be different to the rest of the entire United Kingdom, save for Buckingham Palace or wherever the monarch is? That is to say we can mount demonstrations there. Well, I don't think that uh, under our current laws, anybody is allowed to say whatever they like to whomever they like, wherever they like. But the issue with these, with these buffer zones, and this is why they have been brought in in other countries, and this is why Ealing has brought them in, is because women accessing abortion services, not all, but some, will be particularly vulnerable. And for them, confidentiality and being able to access that service uh, free from harassment and intimidation is extremely important. And this is about the balance but of there, the rights. These but there are already laws in place that allow for harassment, for women not to be harassed and allow for people to be arrested. Why are they not sufficient? Oh, well, over the last few years, we really did try to work with local police forces um, to, to use existing powers. But the issue with some of the harassment legislation is you're really putting the onus on individual women accessing abortion care to, to pursue police complaints when, for very understandable reasons, uh, women in those situations may not feel that they want to go through uh, potentially court proceedings in order to rectify this. And, and so this is, this is the solution we came to. And indeed, Ealing Council, Ealing Council uh, repeatedly met with these protesters and asked 
if there was any way they would consider, you know, modifying their behaviour in order to not harass women. Right. And, and they and they rejected those attempts at, at you know, creating it, a form of compromise. But it is, it so it, is, yeah, it is opposing free speech, isn't it? Well, I mean, that is how, obviously, that is how, how they are painting it. But well, what in, in what way is that wrong? If, if you will allow that, quite rightly, there are laws in place that anyone who unduly harasses a woman, or indeed a man seeking to visit a woman there, can be arrested for harassment or intimidation. So quite, what you or what the local authority has done around your clinic is actually to deny free speech, isn't it? It is to say that these people are not entitled to harass women outside these... No, no, no. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm sorry. No. We, we accept there is anti-harassment legislation already. Yes. So surely but, but you should be lobbying to get the police to nick these people if they are harassing these women or whoever else it might be. Nick them. We've got the laws. Don't deny free speech. No, but absolutely. But it, it comes back to my point that actually in the circumstances of a woman accessing abortion care... Of, potentially a very vulnerable woman, the idea that she should, the owner should be on her to pursue a complaint with the police, uh, breaching her medical confidentiality, that is just, it, it's just not workable. It's just not workable. So therefore, these measures need to be brought into place. And, you know, absolutely. I think that, I think that with free speech, we're talking about a balance here. And these women should also be able to access safe, legal, NHS-funded medical care free from harassment. Their freedoms to do that should be respected too. Catherine O'Brien is Head of Media and Policy at the British Pregnancy Advisory Service. Thank you. A word from you on that, Mr Hacking, that these women should be available to... Well, should I, be I, able I, to... Look, avail go on. Well, I think they, they are absolutely denying free speech, um, but what's more, they're denying um, the opportunity for vulnerable women to receive... Um, you know, um, potential life-saving care. So I'm not talking about Abort 67 so much as um, the Good Counsel Network, which operates outside of Ealing. You know, they, they've helped hundreds of women um, continue in pri crisis pregnancies and give birth to children that they, that may, uh, you know, sometimes were in very dire circumstances. Yes, um, but, but last... And they're, they're preventing... Lastly, they're preventing my, my, listeners, my, my, my listeners would ask you that uh, a young woman who's been raped by her grandfather and has decided, understandably many would say, to terminate the pregnancy, visits a clinic and you or some of your supporters put pictures of fetuses in front of her face. How appropriate is that? What gives you the right to do that? Well, it, we're simply, we're, I mean... It, Doesn't, you don't know, at least you using, accept you have no right to do that, do you, Mr. No, Hacking? I do. No, it's not, it's not so much... It's a, I'm, I'm a, we, don't, we, don't, we, don't, we don't want to compound people's misery. Well, what do you think you're doing by it's showing them pictures of fetuses? Well, it's not exactly a way of saying happy... What do you think abortion, good what morning, you think abortion is it? does? Which is often women who have, con who have conceived in rape and then go through an abortion, they feel a double um, responsibility. Cause they How do you like, know? It's, How many children it's, have you born as a result of rape? Nick, Nick, I can I can I can understand the testimonies of women. I have ears. I have a compassionate heart. Believe it or not, I can listen to people's testimonies. I can and I can make moral conclusions from those testimonies. Which is we the, the assumption here is that abortion turns back the clock. That it reverts, um, it reverts the situation back to normality. It doesn't. Abortion ends a human life, and it has consequences: psychological, physical, and emotional consequences that BPAS aren't prepared to really um, educate women on. So it's All right. Christian Hacking is spokesman for Abort 67, an anti-abortion organisation. Again, thank you. Uh, Celia's called from North Wembley to talk about uh, the Alfie Evans case and the questions it raises really about parental rights and the rights of doctors in these extreme cases. In any case, actually, but in these extreme cases, the parents' uh, rights seem to thin out, do they not? Celia, um, it, 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 do, do you think that the older Hay now have to reconsider, given that Alfie has survived largely unaided since nine o'clock last night. Absolutely. I mean, it's nothing to do. It's, it's none of. It's never been any of their business, as far as I'm concerned, when it comes to these matters. Because when it, parents and children, I should imagine, are very sensitive to their children. They're living with these conditions day and night. Their opinion should matter more, if not the same, or more as a doctor's. And any doctor, I have no respect for a doctor who does not consider, uh, doesn't allow for the unexpected. You know, people are told they won't walk and they do. Now he's off a ventilator and he's breathing. It's absolutely none of their business. Well, 
It, to say it's none of their business, um, it, I understand what you're saying, but it is their business because they're the medical team. So it, they have to feel engaged and they have to feel like it's their business. Otherwise, why, why go to hospital? Um, the other thing I would say uh, to you, Celia, is uh, yes, parents without doubt have a, have a connection, a strong connection to their children. Of course they do. But a, a, a medical team has to treat the patient and, and in extremes, the patient has to be their central clinical concern. And, 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 and parents aren't, I'm not saying the Evanses aren't, I don't know anything about them, but not all parents get it right or treat their children well. So uh, hospital doctors and nurses have to look at their patients' interests and act in what they believe to be well, their really? patients' interests. Well, they do, Celia. Right. Well, well, then, then they should really confine themselves with things like Baby Peter, if you remember, when such a child goes to the hospital and he's sort of sent home with his uh, with his parents, where he eventually dies. They need to concentrate more on that. When it comes to this type of situation, I, I don't really rate what the doctors have to say. Only what the parents want. But don't if they want to go to another practitioner? It's up to them. But, but don't you also see that, again, aside from the Alfie Evans case, don't you also see that uh, nurses and doctors have to look at their patients' whole situation and make judgment but calls that are very difficult? Sure that they know what they're doing? How no, can you be sure they know what they're doing? No, I'm, I'm not suggesting that people don't make mistakes, but I am suggesting that parents oh, wow. aren't always right. That's all I'm saying. Yes, of course, parents aren't always right, but neither are doctors. And, no, I, and I suspect I would go with the parents because we're given a situation where the parents might not be right, the doctors might not be right. I would go with the parents because they're living with this child 24-7. Well, so are the doctors and nurses. Are they? Well, he's in the hospital with them. He's their, he's their focus. Right. Okay. No, I, I understand. I, you, you won't hear me not supporting parents, but the reality is that doctors, teachers, whoever comes into contact with children, they have to put the child's interests as they see them first. And they have to also, if they have reason to think that the decision making of a parent is harmful to that child, they have to operate on the part of the child, don't they? Right. But now we discover that when he's off the ventilator, apparently he's breathing. Yes, yes, he is. And and that clearly, uh, you know, the, the hospital said that he would die shortly after its withdrawal. And, and I'm not going to sit here and predict. Well, there you go. Yeah, well, I, I, who, what do they mean by shortly? I mean, I, I'm not going to predict anything about when or how Alfie Evans will die. Um, uh, but it's 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 an impossible situation. I, I I support what you say about parents, Celia, but I also see very clearly that you know agents of the state, whether it's a teacher, a doctor, uh, uh, whoever, needs to also make the child their focus. And if they have concerns about what the parent wants to do to the child or with the child, that they have to be allowed to state those concerns. Celia, thank you. So let's go to Ron in Shepherd's Bush. Hello, Ron. Yes, hello Ian, hi. Hi. Um, yeah, um, there's obviously no anti-Semitism in uh, Labour, none whatsoever. <laughs> really? Um, okay, what's this meeting all about then? Um, but there is plenty of anti-Zionism, definitely. There's, there's, there's no doubt about that. Um, uh, we, in, we, are, we on the left and in Labour, uh, especially, um, think that uh, the abomination of the state that they call Israel is a criminal entity, butchering and uh, annihilating the indigenous Palestinians at will, uh, with impunity, with no recourse, with no punishment. And um, the actual formation of the state is uh, one of the greatest crimes against humanity. So you don't even think um, there should be an Israeli state? Well, there shouldn't be a state for a, a, a religious cult. Of, of, of people. Uh, wow, but, you're, you're calling but, but, Judaism a religious cult. You, Ron, are an anti-Semite. It's, 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 it's a cult. No, it's you're, a you're, cult. A, you're an anti-Semite. You hate Jews, don't I, you? I, uh, no, I don't hate Jews. Yes, you do. And I, I don't. But, but let me correct you on something. The people using that phrase anti-Semitism are not Semites. They're white Europeans. They're white Ashkenazi, Yiddish, Sephardic Europeans. Most, the vast majority of Semites are Muslim. But some uh, Jews aren't Semites, wow. Well, well, white, white European Jews are not Semites. 
that that's plain fact. If you if your if your heritage is white Eastern or Northern European or European full stop, you're not a Semite. You know you can you can get away with calling yourself Ashkenazi. You can get away. So you're anti-Israel, uh, anti-Jew, anti-Semitic, anti the Zionist junta in in Israel. Mm. I'm anti I think, the imperialist. I think Ron, um, we have drawn uh, our conclusions as to what your views are, and frankly, we don't want to hear any more of them. Thank you very much. Uh, back to your calls. Valentine is in Nottingham. Hello, Valentine. All right, good afternoon, Ian. How are we doing, Matt? Hi, what would you like to say? Uh, yeah, I just want to talk to you about the subject about the uh, what uh, Boris Johnson said, because, I mean, he sort of tends to uh, come up with statements without having any... Uh, without thinking of what's actually, you know, the impact that it's going to have in the country. Uh, well, well hang, hang on a second. First of all, he's been very consistent on this. He's always believed in having uh, an, an amnesty. And second of all, it was said in a cabinet meeting... Um, and he didn't expect it to be leaked from that cabinet meeting. So um, I think we've got to give him a little bit of, uh, cut him a little bit of slack here, haven't we? Well, I suppose in that fact that uh, you're right, because obviously he's been saying it for a couple of years. But I mean, like I said to your researcher, I'm talking from experience. I used to be an illegal immigrant who came in this country in uh, 1999. Um, I don't hold anything against these people who try to, you know, make a better, a better life for their family. But uh, obviously, I'm not not illegal anymore. I got legal from 2004. Met a lovely lady in this country who's now my wife. You know, we've got a beautiful seven-year-old boy. You know, we've made uh, we've made the life of ourselves. But it's costed me the best part of five thousand pounds to do it properly. Oh yeah, I, I had to apply for the uh, proper documentation, which required me to go back to my home country to apply for the visa over there, which I was given. Then I had to come in this country with a two-year visa, which I had no resource to public funds. So I had to support myself through everything, you know. And uh, after that, I had to reapply for uh, naturalisation, if I remember right. And then you also get given the opportunity to apply for British citizenship, which I now do hold. So it's costed me a lot of money. And by giving these people a clear slate to say, look... Anybody who's here, if you've been here over 10 years, you can come and apply for things. What's going to happen to good people like me who've paid a lot of money? You know, I know a lot of people in this country who are illegally, you know, and, and they're working on the black market. They don't pay any tax. They don't pay a national insurance number, you know. And bottom line is, it's people like me and you who work and, and, and pay in tax who end up paying for these but, but people. It, 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 haven't, you, haven't, like haven't you actually put an argument forward for doing this now? Because you said they're all working in the black market. Well, of course, if they were regularised, they'd all be paying taxes and the country would be better off. Well, you would think so. You would think so. But unfortunately, you know, as I say, I can only talk from experience. You know, the people who I know, if you give them half the chance, they still want to work in the black market because they don't like paying taxes. They don't mm. like obeying the laws. You know, it's, just because I'm nosy, and feel free to tell me to mind my own business, yeah. but when you came here in 1999, where, where did you come from, and, and how did you come I here? Came from, I came from Albania. Right. Uh, I came from Albania in 1999. I came on the on a Eurostar, because in them days, the laws weren't nowhere near as strict as what they're now. You know, it's, That's why, obviously, I've seen this country change over the years, and that's why it makes my, my, my blood boil when I see what's happening in this country now, because, you know, this country is very generous, Ian. You know, and people take the generous, generosity of this country for granted, and it shouldn't be like that. You know, I work hard, you know, every single day, five days, six days a week, you know, to, to, to put food on my table, to pay my bills, and, and to be an upholding member of society. Like I say, I've got nothing against these people who came over here, but do it properly. Don't expect everything for free, because nothing is free in this world. If, it's so, if you're getting something for free, it means that somebody else is paying for it. And nobody's got the right to wear a badge of honor about anything to say that I'm entitled. You are not entitled to anything. You are entitled to something when you've put something on the table. And that's where my main gripe, unfortunately, with this country is here. Because we bend over backwards for people, and it shouldn't be like that. Because bottom line is, if I didn't like it, I know where the door is. I can always go back to Albania. But believe you and me, right, <laughs> you know, you will find it nowhere near as good as what we have in this country. You know, you've got the freedom to express yourself. You've got the freedom to, to be whoever you want to be. And anybody who says that you can't be free in this country, believe you and me, they don't know what they're talking about. If you're not happy in this country, go somewhere else. But you've got to respect the, the rules of, of the land. 
and that's where, where you know that's where I stand here. Well, really enjoyed talking to you. You've certainly acquired the East Midlands accent there, <laughs> Valentine. Thank you very much. Let's go straight to the callers. Nick, a first-time caller of this show who lives in Richmond. Hello, Nick. Yes, hi there. So I, I wanted to say um, what leads into this question is, in a lot of ways, this country is a real basket case nowadays. We want to ban police all-male choirs for not being inclusive enough. <laughs> uh, a, lot of people, a lot of people don't even believe what comes out of their own mouth in this country because of political correctness. And when it comes to the borders, it's, it's no different. We've got so much virtue signaling, social justice warrior behavior, uh, leftist snowflake behavior. Well, why do we have borders? Why do we have laws? If, if well, we're going to deal with it. Well, it's a good question to ask Boris Johnson, who, by the way, Nick, I think, will be toasted and cheered to the rafters in Richmond and elsewhere tonight where house prices are expensive. You can just see the conversation. Oh, darling, isn't it marvellous? That nanny who came from South Africa, you know the one. She lives in a shed at the bottom of someone's garden in Ealing. Um, she's now going to get a British passport. You know, that's the point about this, Nick, isn't it? That illegal immigrants within the economy, you know, often actually work in slave conditions. Morally, um, illegal immigration is wrong at every level. But why, Nick? Why, Nick, is Boris part of that? set? Well, I think it's part of this mindset of anything that hints towards nationalism is terrible, nationalism is terrible, and we need this globalist uh, op operation to work. Um, I, I mean, I, I like my flat in, in Richmond to be able to control its own affairs. I like a country to be able to control its own affairs. Do you think this will damage Boris's chances of getting the top job when May goes? I think a lot of people don't buy into this type of rhetoric. I think a lot of people are tired of it. The, the media is filled with these kind of leftist narratives. Politicians talk to them. I think most people just don't buy it. No, I agree with you. Nick, I'm with you. Thank you. McCluskey's intervention, how helpful or otherwise, the people, the sorry, the Labour MPs who are calling out anti-Semitism, they need to be held to account. Carl in Tottenham. What would you say to Mr McCluskey? Good morning. Um, I, I agree with him to a, a big extent because... If you notice, the people that have been going to all these demonstrations against Corbyn are all the same people. And the one at the top of the pile is John Woodcock. Right. He turned around and said he'd never vote for him to be Prime Minister anyway. Right. So if it's the same people doing the same things all the time, then something's got to be there, hasn't it, Nick? Well, the same people were outside the, the Labour people, central they're, office... They're, they're the same Hold people on. outside all the time. No, but the same people were outside the Labour... Central office heckling Ruth Smith when she arrived yesterday. They wasn't heckling her. They was. The, oh no! I'm so gentleman. sorry. They, There's two sides to the story. No, they There's were. There, for every story. Well, there was some now, heck, heck going on because I heard it on the tele. I saw it and heard it on the TV. Yeah, and then you work out what he said. Can you explain to me how that is racist? I think to, well, A and 1 by the Jewish woman herself, she suffered offence, so yeah. I'm not and saying that that... Have, have you, have you, Carl, have you, you asked me a question. Have you question. worked out whether we... Yeah, OK, no, I'm just asking. Have you worked out whether Excuse we knew me. that she was Jewish beforehand or not? Uh, yes, I would have thought so, yes, clearly. Yes, everyone well, knew. He, well, he definitely, well, he, so he definitely knew that she was Jewish. Well, yeah? like, the, the, the expression... The, hang on, hang on. The, the expression working hand in hand with the Daily Telegraph working hand in hand. would seem to imply that as we're looking at the copy of anti-Semitic report... So it's and he's... Well, you asked me a question, Carl. Yeah, and he has singled out this Jewish woman and says she is working hand in hand with the Daily Telegraph and then questions her motives and actions and indeed the authenticity of what she's done. Now, I'm not saying that's case proven and there will be, and, and I, I, I couldn't possibly judge solely on that, but I would say there's a case to answer, yes. No, it seems to me that every, all, 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 all the uh, right wing press, shall we say, with a big well, R. The, well, let me ask you this, Carl. To, to, to knock, Carl, the, knock the Carl, out of this, Carl, an expression. Carl, do you, yeah, do you see a problem of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party? Do you see a big, any bigger no. in the Labour Party than in the Conservative Party? Could, could you, I'll answer your question, let's do it in order. I see, I see a problem in the Labour Party as big as a problem in the Liberal Democrats or in the Conservatives or in the Greens. Can you point to... Can you, can you tell me it's any bigger in the, in, in the Labour than it is in the Conservatives? Yes, I can, because I, to the best of my knowledge, unless you're going to tell me differently, there aren't 90 members of the Liberal Democrats, the Greens or the Conservatives who are currently under investigation by anti-Semitism, some of them dating back two years, and 20 members under suspension for anti-Semitism. Of any of the other political and no, parties, and, and no one's looked into the Conservatives' uh, 
yes. I, you, 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 my like goodness me, you think you think that wouldn't be made public? Carl, there is a problem. I'm not too sure. I'm not too sure. Yeah, there is a problem. Yeah. But there's also a problem with people like not, not mixing, like you've said before, with um, certain um, ethnic minorities not mixing with other people. I live in Tottenham. Right. And I work in Stamford Hill. And I go up that area every single day. And I make eye contact with certain people of an orthodox thingy. And they won't, awesome. they won't talk to me. They don't talk to anyone else. They, they stick to their own. But have I ever heard you on this radio station turn around and say that these people want to stick to their own and don't want to have nothing to do with anyone else? But I'd have but no problem. No, it hold on. All but, the time against no. women. Anyone who's got a brown skin, you seem to justify anything that's been said against them. But when it comes to the Jewish minority, you hold that up to an esteem that no one else can hold it to, Nick. And that's what you keep doing on this radio station. All the well, time. All, right. all the time. All right. I, I, I would suggest let's just leave it with just a cold, hard analysis of numbers. 90 cases of alleged anti-Semitism, 20 members suspended in the last two weeks, some cases back two years. Let, let's put a motion to one side and just look at the figures. Carl, I must move on. Thank you. Let's hear from John in Romford. Hello, John. Hello, good afternoon, Sheila. I just wanted to say, I was listening to Charlie Faulkner talk, and I really laid this problem fair and squarely on the Labour Party because uh, Andrew Neither wrote, um, I think it was in 2011, uh, regarding uh, um, Labour's open door policy. They, del they deliberate, and you said that they opened the doors up to immigration because we needed the Labour force. But he, he in his uh, um, memoirs, I, be I believe he said that Labour opened the borders up to rub the right's nose in diversity. Now, what that did, and, it, that, and they seriously, they managed to achieve it. While I, you know, the Windrush people are obviously British. I mean, it's madness. Probably civil servants being, you know, being absolutely stupid about their jobs, not thinking what how they should operate and what they should be doing. But I lived in an area where the where immigration became well, it overwhelmed us. Really, it just overwhelmed us. We couldn't believe how many people come, how quickly, how it changed our little our working class town. How the housing had all gone. Our children couldn't uh, no longer get housing. It drove up the prices of private rented sector. As that fella from the Green Party can say, that six million increase in population, we couldn't have built them houses, by the way, since 2001. Six million people with that population increased by. Now, even with every, probably with every builder uh, assigned to building houses with and, and, and trying to get the planning through council, we'd have never built enough houses for, for, for the population increase that we had, which subsequently means we've got expensive housing, expensive private sector housing. But you know, that the, but you know don't you, John, that the, that the problems with housing pre-existed? That they existed before that? No, Sheila, they didn't. This no, was, no, they did. Back in the 90s, you could get a council. No, they did. They did. If, if they didn't, why did Labour have to uh, bring in a homelessness czar? Why did they have to bring down the levels of homelessness that they did, which have gone up again, by the way? Sheila, I'll just explain to you. Andrew Neither. Listen, if you don't believe me, read what Andrew Neither said. He said, Labour deliberately opened up the borders to rub the right's nose in diversity. It was all deliberate. But John, I, I yeah, speak root I jealous. speak I speak regularly to employers who tell me that they need the foreign labour that they have. Maybe they do need aspects of the foreign labour. No, they need. They, they don't need aspects of it. They need the foreign labour that they have. Now that doesn't mean. Let me speak now. That doesn't mean that there aren't illegal immigrants working here and there aren't employers uh, it, it knowingly employing illegal immigrants. That should stop. Not least because of the the space it leaves for exploitation. Of course, that should stop. Of course, we should have a policy on illegal immigration. My question is whether we should have a removals target or or is that really just the wrong way around. We need to build an immigration policy from the from the front rather than looking backwards. Do you see my point? I see your point, but let's take the word illegal. If they're not, if they're legal, they can stay. If they're illegal, they should be removed, regardless of targets, regardless whether there's 300,000 or half a million. If they're illegal, they should be removed. If they're legal, they should be staying. 
simple as that, really, isn't it? That's well, or, it or, or, again, I'm, try I'm trying to take some of the emotion out of this discussion and bring it back to the brass tacks of the economy, growth, productivity and the need for workers. We're at almost full employment in this country. If we send away a lot of the people who are, who are here, legal... You know, we already hear that nurses in the EU, in the, the NHS, EU nurses are leaving in, in numbers. If, if we turn our backs on immigration in the numbers that you're describing, mm -hmm. what about productivity? What about the economy? What about growth? Because it's a balancing act between the two. Sheila, I went to Limehouse yesterday. It took me two hours on the A13. We, you know, productivity is probably being affected by the sheer fact that you can't get around the country because we're out, the roads are absolutely jam-packed. There's no movement. Of, and our best they are in the southeast of England, John, but do you get out of the southeast of England much? Well, yeah, sometimes. I'm obviously... I do go around the country, of course, up to Scotland and elsewhere. And it's very different, isn't it? But they don't want to go to Scotland. Most of these because no. <laughs> but it's very different. In, you know, the the, the 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 clogging up that you're talking about being the reason for the lack of productivity. That's not what it is in this country. It's skills, actually. Well, I beg to differ with you on that because I don't see that Hungarian beggars in London and you know you walk down Charing Cross Road. I do too. There's hundreds of them. Know, but I'm not. Around. I'm not arguing arguing with you that a Hungarian beggar or any other kind of beggar or homelessness person on the street is. We don't want a single one of those people living like that in this country, whether they're illegal or legal or British citizens who've ended up in that situation. Of course we don't. But I'm. But but you've just leapt from a conversation about employment, the numbers of workers that we need a common sense approach a less emotive approach to immigration to a, an illegal hungarian beggar on the street you know we, we have to try and keep keep our heads about this but you were talking about productivity and my response to that was that we, we, it's very difficult your to response to that was look at that beggar no, no, no. My response was I tried to get to Limehouse yesterday. It wasn't that at all. You know, no, I, no. I, I, ra I raised productivity. Beggars as opposed to okay, let's not have a fight about it. But and what I'm trying to say, John, is if we could be pragmatic about immigration and less emotional about it, there'd be less cruelty, there'd be less finger-pointing. It, it would inherently be more humane. That's absolutely right. And if we had a sensible immigration policy, people would be housed, people would have doctors and be able to get doctor's appointments. And if we had a more productive economy, uh, we'd have more money in the coffers and we'd have better public services. See how it works at 1.45. Andy's call from Farnham. Hello. Hello, Sheila. Hello. What did you want Hello. to say? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to really say that on the last referendum... What you've got to understand is that the majority of the people in this country voted to leave Europe and have a strong immigration policy, which is yep. exactly what we've got. You're now saying, you know, let everybody in. I'm not. You're, At no point, not. I'm not. This is what you do. I am not saying that. I do opinion. not think that. I've said the opposite in the first hour of this programme. I am not saying that, Andy. Well... <laughs> We've got to have a strong policy. Yeah, well, no, we've got to have a good policy. Obviously, yeah, exactly. We've got to have people that can do the jobs, doctors and nurses. Yep. The vast majority of people that come into this country in the last five years can't speak English, haven't got any skills at all. Where's your evidence and for that? Country... Well, it's true. What, no, oh, it's true. It's... Where's your evidence for that? Have it's you, true. Have you been to Luton lately? Have you been to Reading? Have you been to Slough? Where do you live? I expect you live in the middle of London, do you? I do. Yeah. So you've had no experience of these places. That's not true, Andy. I travel. Well, it okay. I well, it isn't actually. I travel around the country a lot as part of my job. I'm from Liverpool. I spend a lot of time there. I go to Edinburgh. I go to Glasgow a lot. I go to Manchester a lot. So it isn't true. I, I don't just sit in the middle of London, um, uh, inviting well, immigrants that. into the country. Yeah, but why are you so weak and? protecting our country. I can't understand it. I do I'm, not understand. I'm, well, I'm, I feel I'm doing the opposite, actually. Uh, if, if in terms of protecting your country, I, I'm trying to have a conversation where we take as much emotion 
out of immigration as possible and talk in yeah. prag now let me finish this point pragmatic yeah. humane terms you began sure. by saying i want to let everybody in i do not i never have i never will it would be a silly policy what i'm asking for is a policy that works and for the policy to work your targets shouldn't be about deportation your targets should be about who we want to come here and why. Get that right and you won't need targets for deportation. So why out of the last five or six callers you've had has everybody saying the opposite? The, the criminals and people, illegal immigrants, need to be deported from this country. Yes, they do. There's no excuse for that. There's no excuse. Because I never said, that, I never said they don't. After it. Yes, you are. <laughs> Your whole tone and excuses all the time, same as Diane Abbott, you might as well go up to Heathrow and hand out British shoes and... They come off the aircraft. Have you actually got absolutely. ears, Andy, that, that work? I have. Yes, I have. And I'm a proud Englishman, and I'm upset for my children and for the future of this country with what's happening. And you and think no that, that the, and you and you anything. think that what I have said amounts to let everyone in and deport no one. Is that what you're hearing when I speak? No, but you're harbouring on the side of a weak border. You're not. You're not controlling I'm not. Anything. I'm really We're not. Be like Australia. I'm not. I think we should have border checks. I think we should have better people? coastal checks. I think we should have a more sophisticated, smart immigration policy. I think we should plan ahead better for the employment numbers that we need and for the population numbers that we need. None of this, none of this amounts to what you're describing. The vast majority of people that come in cannot speak English. And your evidence for that is, it's true. Thank you, Andy. Andy and Farnham. Well, let's talk to Nick, who's in Brentwood. Hello, Nick. Hello, good afternoon. Hi, what would you like to say? I don't say why we shouldn't have targets for removing illegal immigrants. Illegal immigrants are exactly what they say. Illegal. They, are, they shouldn't be here, and why should they not be targets? But what we can't understand is why is everybody shying away from having targets for removing these people? But why, why do we this need is, targets? This is, this is the thing. Sure, surely the border force and ha then, hang on, hang on, hang on. The border force and the Home Office should be doing their job anyway and removing people who are here illegally. Why would you need any target? Does it go on forever? Do we let these illegal immigrant people stay forever and say, oh, we'll keep you here for another two years? There has to be targets. We have to say, by, the, by such and such a date, will we remove 75 or 80 percent of illegal immigrants? Well, but that, that's not that's not how these targets were working. They were saying to the people in the in the individual regions of the United Kingdom, uh, we are expecting you during the course of 2017 to remove. I, I've no idea how many it was, but let, let's say it's five five hundred illegal immigrants for the whole of East Anglia. Um, I don't know what sanctions there would be if they don't meet those targets. But of course, there is then a pressure to to reach that target and maybe um, eject people who, in other circumstances, you might not eject. No, we're talking about illegal immigrants, though, aren't we? Illegal immigrants. Not people where there's any doubt or... Well, we are, but you, you do... But we, 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 do, we, do live, we do live in a humane country where we, we give people a, a chance to state their case. We don't just round people up and throw them out. Why not? <laughs> well, you know, do you know, as soon as, as soon as I asked that question, Nick, I thought I'm going to regret asking that. And sure enough, I did. Don't go, Israel. Israel, don't go, sir. Stephen Hemel Hempstead, I think, is going to tell you you're being cruel to Bruno. Go ahead, Steve. You're through to Israel. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Um, just one, one quick question to um, to Israel. I Israel, yeah. Yeah. Would you put one of these collars on one of your children? Just aren't just interested. Israel. Yes. Oh, and then you are inhumane totally. I, th I think I've made my point. Thank you very much indeed. No, you haven't. Have you ever felt that the simulation uh, was shot? Goodbye. Shocking? Would you answer, Steve? Would you answer Israel's question? Have I what? Sorry? Israel, your question? My question is, have you ever felt the stimulation that you received from a shot collar? Uh, no, and I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't put it well, on my I children. Have, because I, put it, I put it on myself. To try it out, and I knew what. So well, I knew what the dog was feeling. But you uh, are typical of, of all the people who are anti, because you don't think tell, that don't I tell me what delivery. I am typical of. Stop being so self-important. Stop being so utterly superior. You 
are the sort of person who would put this on one of your children. I am one sort of person who would not. I think you well, would you find the that the majority of people would, would, you please, would you please let me finish? I, I think you would find I'm similar to what uh, had the similar views to what most people in this country would think. You go and put your kids in electric chairs. I'm sure you'll be, you'll all be very happy. What a ridiculous co uh, conversation. Steve, thank you. Israel, thank you for that. Bill and Faversham, you disagree. Trump is the man. Uh, well, Sheila, this is basically a book he used to he produced, I think it was in the 80s, called The Art of the Deal. And it started out, you're doing the deal, and he, all that stuff about Rocket Man and Fat Little Man and everything, the Bella Coast coming from a really negative position. And basically, um, he has negotiated something which no one else, no matter how smart and erudite these presidents have been for the last 50 or 60 years, got them both around the table. And even Syria, what was going on there, is called what is known as signalling. He was basically saying, look, if you don't go to the table, we're prepared to drop 100 cruise missiles on a place when we haven't even got all the facts in. And that kind of direction and persistence is what's brought them to the table. But what I do love is all these people saying about how stupid the man is. The guy's a billionaire, he's got the top job in the world, and he was a TV star. If that's stupid, I wouldn't mind a bit of that stupid, you know? Uh, it's Essentially, he's done something that all the other presidents haven't done. and it actually, But not on his own. You, you'd accept it's not on his own, won't you? No, the, 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 uh, the, the uh, Chinese president obviously has put leverage on them. And he is, it, it's, it's negotiation. That's what the guy is all about. He says, I'm not a politician, I'm a businessman. He's ticking his boxes for what he wants to achieve. And that's why he's actually achieving stuff. And all this stuff about he'll kill millions of people. The guy's got family, he's got children, he's got grandchildren. It's just nonsense. Just get over all of the programming that people are putting out about the man who's just actually different and actually achieving things. I tell you, Hillary Clinton would have never brought this about. There'd be a much bigger war going on. This is somebody who's a businessman, not a politician. Will you go down and cheer him on when he comes to London? Uh, will I cheer him on? Um, <laughs> I don't think I could necessarily be uh, doing that because, <laughs> no, because... You're not a cheerleader, but you... No, but... I'm not a cheerleader for him. I'm just so stating facts rather than just doing the repetition of the programming, you know? And all these people are going out. Oh, why didn't they go out for when Saudi Arabia came round or when the other dictators come round? They're going out because it's the trendy thing to do. All right, Bill, thank you. Uh, Bill says very much yes, Donald Trump has been instrumental in this rapprochement that we see today between North and South Korea.